hopefully if there are any, any latecomers, then they can join us in a bit. So we've already had a brilliant start to the day. We've had an explosive, literally, lecture from uh, Dr. Sam Gregson here. And this afternoon, we've got another treat for you. So this afternoon, three of our PhD students in the physics department here at Swansea University are going to be talking about some aspects of their work, okay? So first off, we've got Luke Piper. Luke is a second year PhD student here, and his PhD is on the topic roundabout of black holes and quantum field theory. You can explain that to you. Hello. Um, yeah, so my, my topic is on um, the black hole information paradox. If you've ever heard of that, it's, um, it's a problem surrounding the fact that black holes exist in our universe and also quantum mechanics exists in our universe. So we can't, the way, the way we originally thought of black holes couldn't really coincide with the, we think, correct assumption that quantum mechanics is, is right. And I think the Nobel Prize recently has kind of demonstrated that, that we should kind of hold quantum mechanics as this, as this base to, to fit things around. Maybe. I think people would, some people would disagree with that. But um, So I'm going to be talking to you about gravity and the shocking truth about that you won't believe that your teachers don't want you to know. I mean, they do want you to know, but you'll learn it later on um, because the concepts in it involve quite a lot of maths, but it can actually be described quite beautifully with geometry and quite intuitive pictures of how you think the world might work. So. First off, how have you learned about gravity so far? Um, by the way, if anyone has any questions, please just put your hand up. I, I like to answer questions, it would be nice. So, um, what have we learned about gravity so far? You think, all right, well, things with mass have gravity. So if you have two things here, um, I'll just draw a little, little picture here. Um, say we have the sun and Earth. We know that, we know that the, this is, very out of scale, um, but not that big. It, it's still out of scale, but I'm going to go with it. Um, we know that there's an attractive force between any two things with mass. Now, that's great. I mean, we know that there's an attractive force here, and it's given by this formula. That's it. I mean, whether... Oh, someone's message me. Okay, uh, whether you've gotten to that or calculated something with that, that is essentially what we've know, we knew up until the 1900s, is that um, we know we have this formula, we, we plug F equals MA into here, and then solve for whatever we want, and we can get, we can predict all, all manner of things, right? This, and this is, this is all we knew for a very long time. And it's fine, I mean, it's fine. We, we, know, um, we know that this is right, if I throw a ball it's going to follow what this equation tells me it's going to follow. Uh, if, I, if, I measure, if I measure the orbits of the planets, most of the time it agrees. It's fine. Um, but I'm not happy with it because it doesn't really tell me anything about how, how gravity actually works. This is just telling you what gravity does. Uh, there's an, it's, it's an approximation. Um, so how can we actually go about fixing this, is what Einstein did in the early 1900s. Um, and, it's, and it makes a lot more sense than, it makes a lot more sense than the assumption that things are just connected because of their mass. It is, uh, this doesn't really, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, so yeah, there must be something missing. Um, and what's missing is the idea of space time. So, my very well prepared second slide uh, will tell you, yeah, this. Um, so we know that, that Newton's theory will be right in, in a, certain, um, on a certain size scale, right? So if we, uh, um, but if we look at something that's really, really far away or really, really small, the theory starts to break down. It starts to give us uh, nonsense answers, right? So the, the kind of the normal thing that you get introduced when you're learning, learning about how gravity actually works is is Mercury, right? So we know that the planets have an elliptical orbit. Um, they all have elliptical orbits. Uh, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. No, no orbit's going to be perfectly uh, circular, so, but it goes in an ellipse. 
But what Mercury does is it kind of has a double of it, where it goes around an ellipse, and then the ellipse never actually closes. So if we have Mercury here, it will go around an ellipse. Um, but then the second time it goes around, it will actually like go around like this. And this is a very bad drawing, but it gets the picture across. It will kind of rotate like this. And it will just keep going. And Newton's theory didn't predict this. This is not. This isn't what we had. If you, if you apply the observations, and they just don't match. So what, what does this say about Newton's theory? Well, it's just wrong. Um, but, it, but why is it wrong? Well, so the idea of space-time is what's missing. So one thing I just want you to think about is how we, how we think about points in space. So just forget about time for the moment. Um, if we have a, this one, isn't it? We have a flat, flat surface here, and I pick a point on the surface. Um, there's a few ways we can describe the point on the surface. I can go well. I'm going to go this far uh, around the x-axis. So I'm going to go this far up the y-axis, and I can, I can kind of describe every point on the surface. Um, so that. That is, so if you think of one axis as space and one axis of time, that you've got like a basic um, kind of space-time diagram. So you've got something, if we just think of position here and time here. So if something just stays at a, uh, so a really fast thing. So first of all, um, can anyone tell me what this object is doing? Yes, yeah, great. No, it's just uh, traveling at constant velocity. If I add some, if I add some, um, so one thing we need to keep in mind is that what Lewis is going to tell you about later, well, one, one, one of the consequences of it is that we have to think about space time as this kind of movable thing which things travel through. And the one thing, um, that restricts us, or well, one of the many things that restricts our view of it, is that light can't travel faster than the speed of light. Now, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, so um, there's this like restriction on, on your trajectory through space-time being causal. So like, uh, if, I, if, I send, if I send a beam of light towards Lewis here, um, he can't receive any information before the light has hit him. Right? It's, it's, uh, it, everything is related by this kind of idea that, that yeah, no, information can't reach, reach a point that it hasn't already reached, which makes sense if you, if you assume that light is the, um, the ultimate kind of speed, uh, sp speed range limiter. <laughs> so one of the things that Einstein said to us was that mass actually bends space-time. So if we have if we just think of flat space here. So flat space would correspond to nothing. If we take all of the mass out of, um, out of, the, out of the solar system, um, we, would just have, we would just have empty space. There's nothing here. If, it, there's, if I put some grid on here, I can specify points on it, and, and, it'll, um, and we'll be able to do physics. Um, but it's not that interesting. There's, not, there's nothing here. And, and kind of the, one of the rules that you that you follow when kind of when doing the calculations and when, when thinking about the physics of the, the flat space time is that things follow straight lines. Things will follow. So if you think of one as space and one of time, it kind of gets a bit confusing. So just think of it as some sheet that you're moving on and you live on. Um, things such as Earth traveling through uh, space without a sun would travel in a straight line. I mean, you know this from from this kind of normal diagram of something orbiting, um, it wants to go in one direction. So if the sun were to disappear, the Earth would just go off in, one, uh, in a straight line what, of what we normally think of as a straight line. Um, and then you, as soon as you add the sun in there, it starts going, oh, well, now I have a force. So there's, there's some link to geometry and straight lines here. So what one has to think of is 
what are straight lines in things that aren't actually flat, right? So straight lines on, on my tablet are just normal straight lines. But what if I were to think of a sphere, right? So if I were to think of a sphere, we all know that, that planes travel um, on arcs, right? So if I, if I were to travel from here to, to uh, Australia, I would have to travel in some arc, right? So why is that? Well, because we don't, we live on, we live on the surface of the sphere, I mean, the sphere. If we, if we try to use things that work in flat space on the Earth, it just won't work, right? Up to a point, and that, that this is the crucial thing, is that, that as ultimately really medium-sized things, we're not too small, we're not too big, we kind of just see the approximation. We see the world as Newton saw it, um, because we're not that big and not that small, we kind of have medium energy on the size and the scale of the universe. So I can use Pythagoras' theorem to, to tell me the distance between here and Cardiff, because I can just go, well, it's at that distance down, and I go a little bit distance to the, to the west, to the east. <laughs> and um, and I, I will tell you an approximate distance, and it will be basically right. But if I use Pythagoras' theorem on a sphere, if I just kind of use the map that was this weird projection um, that doesn't really, that, that isn't actually right when you get close, when you get farther away from the equator, um, it would just give me nonsense answers. So we have to think about what is actually a straight line or what is, what is Pythagoras' theorem in other, other geometries, right? So the one for the sphere is pretty easy. It's, uh, they're just circles, but they're circles that are so if you think of cutting a football in um, cutting a football with a plane, right? So if we have like a big knife and we just cut through a football, there will be some intersection. And if we say that it has to go through the center, there will be these things called great circles that go around. And those are the things that connect, um, that are the, like the, what we call them geodesics. Um, which I guess kind of has a, has a link to Earth, if you think about the wording of it, but it's, um, yeah, it's the, the shortest distance path in any geometry. And this can, be, this can be generalized to arbitrary things, and we do generalize it to arbitrary things, and, and this makes it so that we can calculate the, cur the, the curve or the path something will take through uh, any, any space-time that we, that, we, that we impose. So we say that, okay, well, there's a mass in the middle, where other things are going to go if I just throw it at it. So if I, if I just go to, my, um, go to my flat space time here, and I put a sun in the middle that has a lot of mass, lots and lots of mass, it's almost like putting, putting a, a heavy ball on a latex sheet. So the, the, the space time will kind of curve around it. And you've got to bear in mind that this is kind of a cartoon. but. So it really, it's, it's, you know, you have, we have three, point, we, three, um, three space dimensions, one time dimension, so it's kind of hard to visualize, but it's, it's completely fine to do it with, a, with like a sheet. And what we see is a straight line in the region of the, of the sun will change. So it will go, well, okay, well, I'm still following the straight line. As far as you're concerned on Earth, you're still following a straight line. But the straight line becomes this, this path that actually ends up in an orbit. And as far as you're concerned, you're just living on this space-time that, that has mass in it, but it, but, it isn't, um, but it just isn't flat. So you're just following in your local vicinity what you see as a straight line. But if someone was big enough and they could see you, they'd go, well, this person clearly is traveling on a straight line, but in this weird geometry that's uh, that's dictated by the by the mass on it. Um, so one of the requirements that we have, uh, if you if you go into the mathematics of it, is that you require that any any point you can you can localize around any point. And you say, well, if you were an ant living on that surface, it would look basically flat, which is why we 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 have to go quite high up in the sky to see the curvature of the Earth, and we we, we see on Earth it looks flat from where we are, but if you zoom out, it's really, it's really curvy. Um, 
So that's, that's kind of really how we think gravity works. Uh, and, it, and indeed, this, this did predict everything that we, um, um, that in the early 1900s, people thought, well, Newton, Newton's wrong, what can we do? Um, and it did predict the precession of this uh, of Mercury round round the sun, and it's it's predicted loads loads and loads of things. One one of which I don't think you've heard of today, but you might you may have heard of black holes, and this is my uh, area of research. And well, here, hang on. Yes, this is the take home. Gravity equals geometry. It's basically the 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 tagline for everything. Um, so. Um, yes, uh, here you go. So this, I'm not going to explain this equation, really, but this is the famous Einstein equation. Um, and it kind of tells you how um, the geometry and masses are linked. So if we, um, if we look at this side of the equation, yeah, this is the stress energy tensor. It's, it's a, just a, a thing that you can calculate. I think that if you take, if you take, take a theory or you take... Um, um, you take a space time and you say, I'm going to plop some mass in it. You, you get this quantity that you can calculate, and it's, it's, like a, it's all, an almost tangible thing. Um, and what happens on this side is that it kind of generates a response. There's like, okay, well, I'm going to put mass here. What's going to happen to the curvature? And that's, that's what these are. So these things are things that you can um, that tell you all about the curvature. These are, um, and this is the thing that you, that you need to calculate the curvature. So um, kind of all of your information is contained within this, this tight equation, which actually isn't just one equation, by the way. It's, um, so these little things here, um, these things are called indices. They're just um, they're things that tell us that, so they're, they're telling us that there's more than one equation here, that, that we can have, these can take value, different values, and you can have different combinations of the values, so they go from Zero to four, um, zero to four, zero to three. We could go zero to four, but anyway, and they'll give you different numbers of equations. But essentially, we have ten equations here, uh, all in one, and they're very complicated. And people have conferences every year and get really excited about about finding new solutions to, to these equations. And you know, people still use them for, for for more and more complicated scenarios and less complicated scenarios to to probe what happens in. Um, in, in the world, in, in all, a whole manner of kind of uh, scenarios. I mean, I use I use this to. I mean, you just you, you know, it, sometimes you just want to calculate this thing, and it tells you tells you something about the the global properties of what you're working with. So it's a very powerful equation, um, and the mass behind it is very beautiful. So I, I think if you had the chance to study it, maybe in the future, I would. Um, I mean, this is that. This subject is what got me hooked on, on physics, really. Um, I was kind of, I did an undergraduate in maths, and when I got the opportunity to study general relativity, that's really what drew me to, drew me to physics. Um, so yeah, this is a little cartoon. I'm not gonna show you that. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so one, one thing that you can visualize about how, how gravity is actually manifested in geometry is just think of two ants on, on a sphere or two people on, on the globe. I don't know why I didn't think about that before. But two people on the globe standing basically next to each other. And they're walking in parallel lines. So if we're walking in parallel lines on, on a flat plane, uh, we're going to say, well, if we walk parallel to each other, we're not going to meet ever, because they're parallel lines on a straight, on a, uh, on a flat surface. So we all know that straight lines don't meet. Everyone knows that, right? Um, so, so that's what they do. They set off on their journey, and eventually, because they're really, really um, hardcore walkers, and somehow they can walk on water and whatever. Eventually, they right around Norway and all, the, all this, you get um, you get this weird attraction between them. But as far as they're concerned, they're just moving along straight lines. But they actually get closer and closer and closer until they actually they actually intersect. They they meet at the at the North Pole and go, how did that happen? We we were we were parallel to each other and we were walking in straight lines. And they, and they say, well, surely we can't live on a flat Earth. <laughs> um, we have to live on, on some curved surface where, where our geodesics meet 
at some at some coordinates in Galaxy. That's <laughs> that, I mean that's probably not what they said to each other. They just said hi. But um, yeah, so this has been. I, th I think this is a good picture to, to have in mind when you think of gravity. So, yeah. Um, I was hoping to get onto this, but obviously there's not, there's not, not, uh, not room. But in conclusion, Newton was wrong, but he was basically right. Because, I mean, if we just think of where we are now, where he was basically wrong, but right. But um, we think Einstein was right. Thank you. What would it look like if you travelled on a straight line on Earth? Yeah. So the straight lines on Earth are these great circles. So like, um, so that's why, yeah, that's why it's. Um, um, can I do this? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so that that's why we have. Um, That's great. Yep, thank you. So next up, we've got Bill Atkins. So Bill is a first year PhD student here in the in the university in the physics department. And Phil is uh, Bill. Phil, sorry, Bill is going to be talking to us about gravitational waves. Thank you. Okay, hello, hello. Ooh. There we go, it works. Yeah, it feels very professional with the, uh, the microphone, I love it. So, uh, lovely to meet you all. Um, I am indeed Bill, um, and I'm in a, actually a really unique position because I, I came here seven years ago, and I sat, I think, just up there. Um, so I did my, well, I, I came to a Christmas lecture uh, at Swansea University. I was in the first year of my A-levels. I think you're all, is it A-level, GCC, roughly, that region? So I came to Swansea at the first year of my A-levels, and I kind of stuck here since. So I finished my, um, I finished my A-levels. I came here to do an undergraduate, because I, I really liked the university. Uh, did my undergraduate, did my master's here, all in physics, and now I'm in my first year of my PhD, studying gravitational waves. So I'd love to talk to you about a topic quite near and dear to my heart. So let's jump straight on into it. Now. Is it going to let me uh, tick over? It's not. Excellent. Perfect. I have to do it by hand, I think. Okay, so about two months before I actually came to that Christmas lecture, LIGO and Virgo, collaborations in the United States and Italy, uh, they announced the first observation of gravitational waves. And 
this was a massive deal. This completely rocked physics. So we didn't actually have any observation of that. Well, we had different experimental observations of general relativity that uh, Luke spoke excellently about. Um, and we're going to come back to that later. But um, at the time, uh, in kind of 2015, they wanted to, and, well, they wanted to try and discover exactly some, more, some further phenomena that could be kind of experimentally verify this general relativity. It took 100 years for this to happen, so Einstein put it forward in about, put forward his general relativity in about 1916, I think, or 1910s, 1920s. Um, and this, this was another really, really incredible experimental validation of that. And we'll come into just how incredible in a bit. Um, so let's talk for two seconds about it. So we see in the bottom right here, this is the LIGO setup. Uh, so in the center, we have kind of a command center. And then they have two arms, or two, two legs, doesn't matter what you think. Um, they are three kilometers long. Uh, and pretty much, they fire a laser down each arm. Now, those lasers reflect at mirrors, and they come back so that they perfectly destructively interfere back at the command center. Now, the idea is that along that three kilometers, if there is a little nudge or something that affects it, that will be read. That will kind of change the phase of the system, and you can read that back at the, at the origin. So the plan is if you can shield this well enough, then the only effect that can cause that is a change in space time. And that is what they read as a gravitational wave. Now, I've been talking about these gravitational waves. I haven't told you what they are and what we can learn from them. So let's go straight into that. Before I start talking about gravitational waves, though, I'm just going to rehash a couple of things we heard about gravity. So let's talk about gravity. So in the 1660s, Sir Isaac Newton, he came up with this idea that gravity was a force due to the mass of an object. Uh, and this does an absolutely wonderful job of describing a lot. As we saw, it describes most of the phenomena we see. However, it doesn't describe anything, ev everything, rather. It describes a lot, doesn't explain it. And um, Newton, rather, uh, during this time, he actually wrote, he said, gravity is caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. Whether this agent is material or immaterial, however, I have left for the consideration of my readers. <laughs> In other words, that's the physicist's way of saying, I don't know, I have no idea what's going on. Um, and he didn't, and that wasn't his fault. Frankly, he was quite ahead of his time. This was the 1660s. Fast forward another 250 years, and we have general relativity. Herr Einstein came up with a, this absolutely wonderful theory that there exists a space-time uh, within which all objects exist, and mass creates a curvature in that space-time, as we saw. Well, basically, Einstein's idea was that this curvature causes the acceleration we know as gravity. OK, now that we have all these tools kind of out of the way, I can spend a bit of time talking about gravitational waves. So what are gravitational waves? Well, I want you to imagine a lake. If I throw a stone in that lake, what happens? Perfect, it creates a ripple. So I throw a stone in the lake, it creates a ripple, much like the stuff in the top right. That's kind of like a water drop effect. Um, that happens in, in space time. You drop a, a, a <laughs> a planet, I suppose, in space-time, it causes a ripple. Um, think of a boat now going over that lake. It leaves behind a wake. And that wake is completely analogous to things moving through space-time, creating ripples in the space-time itself. Um, and these are things that we can, we can measure, and we have measured. Uh, and in fact, what LIGO and Virgo measured is the in-spiral of two black holes as they begin to merge. So it's much like this picture in the bottom left here. You have two black holes spinning around each other, getting closer and closer together. Um, and then that is what they measured. And it gets much more violent, much more extreme. Um, and the thing that made it quite a special um, achievement, quite an incredible achievement, that won them the Nobel Prize, um, partly was that these black holes were 1.3 billion light years away. So it's such a far measurement. The, the, me the things, the kind of experimental error margins had to be so small. You had to be so precise to get that right. Um, that it was just an incredible achievement. So that's, that's, I guess, the thing that happened. Now, this is data that on the right. This is the exact data of that measurement. Um, and so you can see kind of the, the, the wave getting, I guess, uh, the amplitude getting larger and larger and more and more frequent as it's merging. And so it's getting more and more violent, more and more extreme. Um, so much so, and it settles down at the end, and that is the merge. So we've, we can directly see the merging of these black holes. 
Now, gravitational waves aren't something we really get an intuitive understanding as humans. It doesn't really make sense to have wobbles in time. Um, but something that does make sense is sound. Uh, so we know sound very well. And so we can map these gravitational waves to sound waves. Why not? And so that's what we do. We, we have mapped the sound of these, uh, th this black hole merger. And it's, it's lovely. It's called a chirp. So fingers crossed, if it works, you can hear it today. So let's give it a try. That's it. That is genuinely the sound of a black hole, um, or two black holes merging. And it's such a subversion of expectation. It's like a, a water drop. Uh, let me see if I can run it one more time. So you can, hopefully you can hear out for it. That's it. It's lovely. It's such, such a great sound. Um, so yeah, something that seems to be one of the most violent things has a very beautiful sound, in, in fact. So OK, moving on. If it's going to let me, there we go. OK, what can we learn about black holes? Or what can we learn from gravitational waves? Well, we can learn about these black holes. We can learn about how they merge. We can learn about their size. We can learn about their mass. Um, tentatively, we can learn about their structure. There's, we can peer into a lot of things that we couldn't peer into before. So this really opens a world of gravitational astronomy. OK, we can learn about gravity. So as these gravitational waves travel through the space-time, they pick up the information of the space-time they travel through. So on Earth, we can, we can really learn about the stuff it's traveled through um, by looking at it. And so that's going to tell us a lot about that, uh, well, the, how gravity acts as, as ripples in it travel through, or rather, how, how space-time acts as ripples travel through it. Um, but it's not just black holes we're limited to. There's a lot of modern research into uh, stars or neutron stars, I suppose, neutron stars more so. So the lighter you go, the harder it is to see. Um, yeah, there's a load of stuff on neutron stars as well. Uh, and we can even learn about the Big Bang. So in the very early stages of the universe, um, there was a, a, you may have heard of it, inflation, a period called inflation. So during that inflationary period, or prior to that, there were little gravitational changes. Um, so very tiny dents in space-time. Uh, and then during inflation, they got blown up. And now these are absolutely huge um, on, on massive proportions, way bigger than what we can measure with LIGO and Virgo. However, these have the name primordial gravitational waves from the very early universe. And in theory, we'd be able to measure them. OK, so how will we measure them? Well, we're now moving into the age of precision gravitational wave experiments. We're 10 years on from LIGO, and, well, seven years on from LIGO and Virgo. Um, and we're talking in the next 10, 15 years, where there's two experiments, the two major gravitational wave experiments that are coming out. We've got the Einstein telescope on the left, which is a bit of a mis misnomer because it's built underground. So <laughs> not really a telescope. But on the right, we then have LISA, which is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. Now, OK, I'm going to start by talking about the Einstein telescope, this thing on the left. So the idea is that there are, instead of two arms, like LIGO, there are now three. And instead of it being three kilometers long, it is 10 kilometers long. Or each arm is 10 kilometers long. So this is a really big experiment. You know, we're talking on the size of sun, really. Um, now, the thing that makes this so, in, uh, so incredible is that it is built underground. Now, the advantage to that is that when you build something that's measuring space time, you don't need it above ground. It doesn't matter because the wobbles in space time happen above ground or below ground. So building it underground helps it experimentally with shielding it from noise, from like a lorry going past and, or aeroplanes above, um, which are actually genuine issues that LIGO and Virgo had. So that is the idea of the Einstein telescope. And this should let us look, peer deeper into black holes. And a lot of my research focuses on the stuff that the Einstein telescope will look at. And that's looking in the next 10 years or so. But of course, the European Space Agency and uh, NASA decided, let's just make this one step bigger. And so we've got a very dramatized picture on the right here of LISA. Um, so LISA is this absolutely incredible experiment that takes pretty much the Einstein telescope and blows it up onto a uh, satellite scale. So they thought, well, why not build this as three satellites? And these three satellites, all, uh, well, they, they follow the Earth in an orbit around the sun. Um, and the arm lengths are now, instead of, they're not three kilometers, they're not 10 kilometers, they are two and a half million kilometers long which gives us, as you can imagine, so much more sensitivity. So much so that these things might let us look at primordial gravitational waves. So we might be able to look to the really early universe. And there's some interesting things we can learn from that. 
Okay, so what about my research? Well, okay, what I'm doing is I'm studying the effect of gravitational waves on black holes. So we're chucking gravitational waves at black holes in modified theories of general relativity. So it's not always useful to talk about general relativity, especially around black holes, because it doesn't tell the whole truth there either. However, we can modify it, and then we can test it. And so one of the ways to test it is to chuck a, black, uh, chuck a gravitational wave at it, theoretically chuck a gravitational wave at it, not really, um, and see what pump comes out, see what it tells us. Uh, and then hopefully that's going to give us phenomena uh, and things that can be observed by the Einstein telescope or LISA, um, and we should get some information there. So the reason I've included this especially is because I just want to conclude by saying that seven years ago I, I was sat up there um, watching one of these Christmas lectures, and it's really lovely to be giving one now, um, especially about stuff that I'm, I'm really very passionate about. So I hope you have all enjoyed this, uh, and I'm more than happy to open the floor to questions. Yep. Is there anything that in space that could cause something that sudden? So like Ooh. So, yeah, good question. Um, those sort of black hole mergers are really typical ones because we have this in spiral that we see these, these rippling gravitational wave effects, but when you get that last, that last bit, it's called the ring down phase, um, where it gets really, really fast and violent, um, that's when we see that, that quite pronounced effects of the, the big gravitational waves, and that's when we get the most juicy data. Can you explain how, so in the light, you're saying it lays it down the way next to the arm forever. Yeah. How do the gravitational waves interact with it? What, what okay. Do it? Yeah, yeah. So by a gravitational wave traveling through that, that laser, that laser arm, what it's doing is it's basically causing a shift in phase. It just slightly knocks one of the lasers out of phase. Um, and so what that means is, the, because they were they're perfectly destructively interfering. They then stop perfectly, inter in perfectly destructively interfering. And so on, the, on a like, screen behind it, you get a signal. Um, and that signal is often a lorry, or often a, a plane or something going past, but sometimes it can be, it, it's very distinctly a gravitational wave. So that's how we tell. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, wonderful question. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the typical answer, and I'll give you a more fun one. So the speed of light, typically. Um, but we don't know that for sure. We're pretty sure, but we don't know that for absolute sure. And there are some measurement or some experiments now going on where they put a... Put, or LISA would be very good at it. We could put LISA up in, in the air and have a, a ground-based detector, and you can see how long the um, gravitational wave has taken to, um, to travel between the two. Uh, or to be registered between the two. And that, that will tell us a lot more concretely exactly if it goes at the speed of light or slightly less. So yeah, that's a wonderful question. How do you distinguish between um, whether it's a gravitational wave or the, or the car going past? Is it the yeah. periodicity? Or it's a nightmare. Wave or? It's an absolute nightmare. Um, so almost everyone struggles with this. Um, and pretty much machine le learning algorithms and a lot of luck. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. So, um, yeah, a lot of luck and a lot of practice. Uh, in, in there are sp specific signatures that they can use. Um, I, I, I don't delve into the data that much. I trust the signatures that they, they produce. Um, but, no, it's, it's mainly machine learning. That's how they do it. Uh, are the probability of gravitational waves the same as the primordial density perturbations? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps, perhaps, or perhaps they are, uh, they can tell us about large, large scale scru structure. Perhaps there's some information there that can, can lead to uh, things we can extract, or perhaps just strengthen our arguments further. Okay, Brilliant. Thank you. thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Bill. <laughs> so, our final talk of today is Lewis Cowell, and Lewis is another second year PhD student in the physics department, and he's working on string theory. So thank you, Lewis. Hello. So um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about string theory, but more, more so. Uh, 
that's a good about um, first about um, what I'm hoping is one of the world's most famous equations, and I'm hoping to prove that by you guys guessing it very very quickly. So, does anyone have a suggestion? One of the world's most famous equations. E equals m first time. E equals m c squared. Perfect. So, E equals m c squared. So. Um, over the course of this talk, we're going to present two mysteries, and then we're going to solve those mysteries. Um, one of the mysteries is centered in E equals mc squared. Um, so first, let's, let's set the scene. So imagine I, I, uh, we're going to talk a bit about what it means for two things to be equal. So say I, I have uh, one big jug of water. Um, so I'll draw it. One big jug, which I tell you can hold two and a half liters of liquid. And then I have some smaller containers which I tell you can hold 500 milliliters of, uh, of liquid. Um, how many would I need of the smaller container in order to get the same volume as the larger container? Five. Five, exactly. So I could write an equation that was two and a half liter container is equal to five times the 500 milliliter container. Yeah? So I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you here is that both sides contain the same volume, or in other words, if your friend has five of the 500 milliliter containers and you've got one big two, two and a half liter jug, it would be a fair trade to exchange them one for the other. Another situation which is the same as this is a conversion rate. So for example, uh, one Great British Pound is approximately equal to $1.2, which means that if I have one pound and I go to well, I need to go to a very good currency exchange shop, but they might give me $1.2. And similarly, if you're going on holiday to America, you wanted to trade in 100 pounds, you would get $120. So again, we see that an equality sign is basically telling us that the things on either side are equal. It's a fair trade to exchange the two. So now we come back to Einstein's E equals MC squared. As you can see from, from all of the talks today, Einstein did a lot of good work. Um, so what E equals MC squared, does anyone know what the E stands for? Energy, exactly. And the M? Mass, fantastic. And then C? Speed of light, Speed of light exactly. So what Einstein's equation is telling us is exactly the same as our currency conversion rate and our two volumes. It's telling us that we can trade energy for mass, and the conversion cost is the speed of light squared. So it's quite a high conversion cost, but still. We can trade energy for mass. And, and well, this is, might be a surprising fact, and we can, we can justify it by, by thinking of an al analogy. So let's, let's take the World Cup, which um, is very uh, in-the-moment topic, and imagine the football field. But I'm going to slightly break the rules of football. So in, in regular football, you're used to only seeing one ball on the pitch, but I'm going to generalize that further and take uh, there to be a, a number of balls. So imagine a football field <coughs> with lots of footballs on it. OK, so if I wanted to add more mass to this situation, I could do it by adding more balls to the pitch. Yeah? So, so adding mass is equal to adding footballs. If I wanted to add more energy to the situation, does anyone have any suggestions how I could add more energy to this situation? Kick a football, exactly, as, as we see as uh, their, their key use. So you could go around kicking the footballs, giving them some velocity. So energy, in this case, we're talking about kinetic energy. Um, so we're going around, we're kicking the footballs, giving them some velocity. Um, and actually, there's a name for this. When we have a big container with lots and lots of balls in it, and we're speeding them up, we're making them faster and faster and faster, we refer to this as their temperature. So it's sort of like a coarse-grained um, measure of the velocity. So adding energy. Is, is similar to, to kicking the footballs, which is the same thing as uh, adding velocity or temperature. OK. And so what Einstein's equation is saying is that somehow these two things should be equivalent. And it doesn't seem like that should be so. If you take a football pitch and I tell you I'm going to throw, th throw three more balls onto the field, or I tell you I'm going to go and kick a bunch of them around, it doesn't seem like those two things are at all the same. Um, but this equation claims they're so. So that's mystery number one. Mystery number one, apparently kicking footballs is the same thing as creating new footballs. For mystery number two, again, we're going to use the football analogy. So can anyone tell me, uh, what is the exact mass of a football? 
Uh, and unsurprisingly, it's, uh, no one's got a great answer, and that's because it depends on the football. You know, if, if you take a smaller football or a larger football, they're gonna have different masses. Indeed, I, I looked it up. If you go onto Wikipedia, and you go to the page for pays for football, and you have to go to the disambiguation for football ball, and then you look at the weight. Here we are. Doesn't it depend how hot it is as well? <laughs> well, uh, I guess in the in sense that the material would change based on uh, based on heating it. Yes. So there's there's lots of complications there for sure. It depends how hot it is. Depends what material it's made out of. If it's got a little scratch, that's going to take off some of the mass. So the best Wikipedia can do is it can tell us it's somewhere between 410 and 450 grams which isn't that good, really, if you think about it. If, if you wanted to know the exact value of something, and the best I could do would tell you within 10% of error, it's not a very great answer. So footballs, uh, but that's, that seems reasonable to us, right? If you'd have a multiple number of footballs, why should you expect there to be a mass that unifies all of them? You know, they each have a different mass because they're different footballs. In fact, if I told you, here's a football, I've also given a football to someone in Australia, and actually, they are the exact same mass, but better than that. I've also given a football to someone in, in Switzerland and someone in Romania, and all of the footballs weigh the exact same amount of mass. In fact, every single football in the universe weighs the same amount of mass. You would, you would be rightly suspicious, and so you should be. But let's think about another ball-shaped object, the electron. So if we think about electrons in the universe, and let's go to the Wikipedia page for electrons, and then if I zoom in over here, Apparently, the mass of any electron is exactly 9.109383715 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So Wikipedia, or whoever wrote this Wikipedia article, seems to think that every single electron in the universe weighs exactly this mass. It doesn't matter if it's a slightly bigger electron or a slightly smaller electron, apparently that doesn't make sense. All electrons are exactly the same. So this is mystery number two. Mystery number one, Apparently, kicking balls is the same thing as creating new balls. And mystery number two, every single electron, or in our analogy, football, every electron-styled football weighs the exact same everywhere in the universe. So how do we resolve these issues? The resolution, um, which you guys might have heard of, is quantum field theory. So quantum field theory answers these two questions in, uh, in one single, single go. So what is a quantum field? Well. Let's stick with the analogy of football. So in Luke and Bill's talk, they were talking to you about space-time. So in my case, I'm going to draw space-time as being this large underlying surface, if you like the pitch that you're playing football on. And they talked about how the fabric of this universe is, is, is bendy. It's not really a rigid surface upon which you know, physics takes play. It's more like a, a surface of a sheet on your bed or something. And as weights go on it, they bend and they curve. And, uh, and the physics corresponds to this, which gives you things like gravitational waves, and Luke's talking about black hole information theory. So this is the sort of setting of our universe. Quantum field theory says this isn't all there is. There's also another field, kind of another fabric lying on top of it. In this case, the electron field. And so when you think of an electron, you think of an object sitting on your flat space-time. And we've already learned that the space-time isn't really this kind of unmoving surface, it actually responds to the things on top of it. And similarly, an electron isn't really a single object sitting in your space-time, but it's an excitation of a quantum field. So when I think of an electron, what I actually think about is this, this fundamental field that's li lying over our space-time getting a little bump in it. And similarly, if there's an electron somewhere else, there'll be a bump somewhere else. And all these little excitations, these little ripples, if you like, in the quantum field now, are what we, you know, from a zoomed out perspective, would call electrons. And so this answers the question as to why they should all weigh the same. Because they're not actually different electrons in different places in space-time. They're all excitations of the same quantum field. OK, but then we have mystery number two. Apparently, if I add more electrons, this is the same thing as making them move around faster, giving them more energy. And so this, this, is, this mystery is one of the reasons that we have experiments like the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. So let's, let's look at what the Large Hadron Collider does. The Large Hadron Collider is effectively just a huge donut covered in magnets. Why is it covered in magnets? Well, we put particles, one particle here, inside, and through the magnets, we push it around this donut. So it's kind of taking a path. It's a nicer orbit if you can draw properly. 
and it goes around and it speeds up. So each time it's going around this orbit, it's speeding up. And in reality, we're sending it around again and again and again, thousands and millions of times per second, faster and faster and faster. While we do that, we take another particle just next to it and we send it the opposite direction. And again, it's getting sped up faster and faster and faster by these magnets until eventually, when both of them are traveling fast enough, when we're happy, in other words, we've got taken our footballs and we kick them and kick them and kick them. We have to be very good at football, but we've managed to get them traveling incredibly fast, spinning around this huge donut uh, thousands of times per second. Then we give it just a little nudge. We get one of our magnets, we just give it a little nudge in, and if you imagine, we've got two, two particles spiraling opposite directions around each other. That little nudge is enough such that they collide and they, they knock into each other. They make a huge, a huge collision, a huge explosion with lots of energy. And what Einstein's told us in his equation, E equals mc squared, is lots of energy is the same thing as lots of mass. And so what you might expect if these were indeed footballs is you take your two footballs, they're now traveling incredibly fast, you knock them into each other, they collide, they send out in opposite directions. Okay, cool, probably fun to watch, but you haven't really done much. What actually happens with fundamental particles is that two footballs don't necessarily come back out. Maybe four footballs come out, maybe six footballs come out, and maybe new types of footballs that you've never seen before come out. So this is, this is what E equals mc squared is telling us. It's telling us, say that I take, so E equals mc squared. Say that I tell you I want you to create for me from just pure energy two new footballs. Well, I would tell you, okay, Tell me the mass of your football, times it by two, times it by the conversion cost, C squared. You need to give me that much energy. So this is the energy required to make two footballs. So if I collide my, my footballs fast enough and then knock them into each other, two brand new footballs, such that four footballs an hour are leaving this situation, uh, would, would be manifested out of, out of, well, out of the quantum field. It would look like they came out of nowhere, but indeed, because we now understand that particles aren't really these objects, they're just excitations of a quantum field, you, what you're effectively doing, if we can draw, go back to the picture, so if we imagine this is our quantum field lying on top of space-time, we've got two footballs, two electrons, or in the Large Hadron Collider, two hadrons, coming towards each other. They collide at this point, at this point, all of the energy is concentrated heavily in space-time, and this energy can effectively be converted such that now, when we leave, we've got still maybe the two initial electrons now going in opposite directions because they've collided much slower. But now we've got two new electrons, two new ripples in this, in this, in this quantum field going in the opposite directions. And so this is what the Large Hadron Collider does. It takes footballs or particles, hadrons, speeds them up, knocks them into each other, and through reaching higher and higher energy of these collision, collisions, you can find out new and new particles. So you, you might be wondering, well, okay, in this picture we just find lots of electrons, but what we learn about quantum fields is actually there's, there's a whole host of higher quantum fields. So not only are, they, not only are, there, are there the electron field and the space-time, there's also fields for all the other type of particles. And so you can imagine if we get a high enough energy collision, maybe we can make an excitation in this field. And you might ask me, what field is this? We don't know. We're going to keep looking. We keep probing these higher energies and keep finding new types of particles. Um, this, is, this is the purpose of these collider experiment, experiments. And this is the reason that E equals mc squared makes sense. We're learning that actually energy and mass are interchangeable. You have to pay a very, very high price. I mean, c squared is a very, very big number. But, but nonetheless, you can exchange them. So. Uh, I'll recap. Today we saw two mysteries. Mystery number one, energy and mass you can apparently exchange via Einstein's E equals mc squared. And mystery number two, all of our fundamental particles appear to have the similar properties no matter where we look at them in the universe. And the resolution to both of these is quantum field theory. We learn that space-time shouldn't be thought of as this static, unmoving base upon which physics happens, but it is uh, a fabric that bends and moves depending on the mass distribution. And similarly, Particles aren't just objects that live in this space-time, but they're also fields lying on top of space-time, which themselves have ex excitations, can collide, can create new excitations, and can in interact with one another. So this is sort of one of, the, one of the very impressive things of quantum field theory. It's one of the main theories that's studied today, and, uh, and hopefully that answers our two questions. Thank you.
Any questions? Yeah? Um, uh, do we know all of the like, cost codes associated with each of these things? Yeah, it's a great question. So currently we have something called the standard model, which is effectively um, the picture I've drawn here. We've got a picture of what all of the fundamental fields should be, um, and then we can also do things um, such as you might say, what about if in one situation I have both a pink excitation and an orange excitation layered on top of one another, and they can form a bound state. So for example, a proton is an example of this, where it's not actually a fundamental field, but it's instead a bound state of lots of fundam fund fundamental fields collaborating together. So we have a model that works, um, but it's incomplete. There's things missing, and um, as I say, when we do experiments in the LHC, we find out new things which haven't really been explained yet. And so that's a, a very active area of current research, is trying to find out, find models that will predict these additional things that we haven't understood yet. Thanks. Any more questions? Yeah? So how does it benefit us looking at the excitations in the field over the physical electrons themselves? Like, uh, electrons themselves seem distinguishable in matter, so why is it bad to look at them as an instance? Yeah, very good question. What's, what's the point in doing all this hard work? Because it's a lot harder, you know? It's much easier to think of them as footballs. Um, and the answer is the same thing as when with Bill's and, uh, and Luke's talk. Uh, pictures like Newton's gravity, pictures like the particle representation of electrons, they work, they're good, most of the time. And for most of the time, you shouldn't be thinking about quantum fields, you know? If you wanna kick a football, you certainly don't need to worry about quantum field theory. Um, the answer is that when you test the limits of these theories, they don't work. They actually give answers that, as Luke was saying, don't make sense, don't match experiments. Indeed, no matter how hard you throw together two footballs, you're never gonna get four footballs out. And so, in order to kind of get these fringe edge cases which we don't understand, we have to develop new theories to continue to explain it. And that, that's the reason why we need quantum field theory, to explain these new phenomena that the particle model just doesn't make sense of. Thank you. So the, so when you're looking for sort of new excitations, what, if you're expecting to find something and then don't find it, what would be the case if, for example, it was the excitation was there but it wasn't something you could read or observe in any way, shape, or form? Is that something that bothers you from the overnight? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. So for example, um, it, it, this is a wonderful question because actually it's not as simple as just going to high enough energies. Um, so in particular, you know that we have a lot of collider experiments around the, U around the world. Um, we have the Hadron Collider experiments which throw hadrons together, but we also have ones that throw electrons and positrons together. And you might think, why do we need to throw everything together if it's as simple as just E equals MC squared? And the truth is that's not enough. You need to also obey a bunch of conservation laws. So to answer your question, just throwing things together at a high enough energy, you might not get what you want because there might be some additional law that you also need to obey. So you need to try throwing lots of different things together. And, and once we've thrown everything together that we can think of in all the different ways we can think of at high enough energies, well then we can be relatively happy that we've done all we can. Um, but no, it's, it's not just enough to throw things together and, and you, need to, you need to keep looking. Um, and indeed, indeed many of the current kind of like the Higgs boson for example, um, they're only produced in a very, very special type of, uh, of excitation, of interaction, and, and if you're not hitting that type of interaction, you, you won't see it even if you go to any amount of energy. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah? The volume of the electrons? Yeah, so it's so a great question. So um, fundamental particles have lots of different properties. Um, things like the, the, the size and their mass, those don't change precisely because they're all excitations of the same field. So we couldn't have two electrons come in and two electrons come back with different mass or different volume precisely because these pro properties are fixed. What you can have is close cousins of these particles be returned instead of them. So you throw in two electrons, you get two things that are sort of like electrons. So there's a whole family of things called leptons, um, which are things that are like electrons, more or less. And they'll have similar properties, properties to the electron, but so the, the electron has a more massive cousin um, and, and called the muon, and then the tauon. And so these things can be produced, which are sort of like electrons with different mass, but Conceptually, they should really be thought of as excitations of completely dif different fields, which happen to share a lot of properties. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.
guess that brings us to the end of the Christmas lectures. And thank you very much for all, to all the students and all the teachers for making the effort to join us. Um, and we should actually, again, give a hand to our three PhD students, Luke, Lewis, and Bill, for putting together three presentations on very short notice on really advanced and difficult to explain topics. So another hand for them. And I think we all, it's fair to say that we all hope that all you students who came here got excited by whatever you listened to, whatever you, uh, morning's talk was really exciting, right? We all, we all agree on that one. So hope you all got, got intrigued by the things that you, that you heard today and hope this will spur your curiosity on and that you will, you will pursue science and physics someday and we might see you in Swansea someday. Uh, but I'd also like to thank Dr. Sarah Roberts for helping organize the, the Christmas lectures and our um, MRI team, the marketing recruitment team, for helping setting things up and uh, making this event run as smoothly as it has. Thanks very much for coming and safe journey back.